we've had this incredible relationship with Integrity Music Holly. And yeah. what I love is that each and every month we're given an opportunity to talk with somebody in their roster. Yeah. And it's been phenomenal. It's great hearing about artists' lives, not just about the music that maybe their life uh, inspired. So it's uh, it's fun and we get to do it again today. And, and what I love is that we have a conversation with Corbin this week where uh, he, yes, he's an individual and an artist, but also a part of something bigger in Thrive Worship where we get to find out kind of the inner workings of maybe working with a worship team. Mm -hmm. Which I can only imagine slightly complicated. Yeah. Ah, you know what? Sometimes there's complications that happen. Yeah, whatever exactly. You're going through. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, uh, Corbin Phillips, my friend, how are you? I'm doing great. Now that I got my phone able to stand up correctly, we, we're all good. Doing fantastic. Yes. Technology, I tell you, it'll right. just get you every time. Every time. <laughs> uh, we like to ask this uh, skill testing question, Corbin, because we never know where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. And that is, who are you and where did you come from? Yes, I love that. So, uh, yes, like you said, my name is Corbin. Uh, I am from Sacramento, California area, born in Sacramento. I live in a suburb called Roseville. I've uh, been here my whole life outside of I spent a year uh, studying the Bible in Germany, which was so mm -hmm. random. But uh, I've been here in Northern California where the sun shines most of the time. Yes, that does sound super random. Like, hey, you know, it's a good place to go. Germany. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it is. It's beautiful. But totally. how did that even happen? Well, okay, so I was I was in my senior year of high school and had a couple scholarship offers to play baseball mm -hmm. and um, was kind of considering that. Um, and for whatever reason, I, I had a few conversations um, with a couple close friends, family members, and it felt like God was like, for the first time saying, I want you to do something. And uh, I kind of made a decision that felt really strange and didn't make a lot of sense at the time, but decided not to go to, to school and play baseball, but to go to Germany with a couple of friends and study the Bible at a school called Bodensehof, which was honestly responsible for a number of things now in my life. Uh, one, my my spiritual foundation in a lot of ways. Um, it's also responsible for me going into music rather than sports, which I think is uh, why we're having a conversation today. So kind of crazy. Yeah, this could have been a completely different conversation in uh, Corbin, who's the you know first baseman for <laughs> insert whatever team would be here. Right. So then, growing up, was was music ever a part of your life, or was it more sports and then music took a back burner? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it was definitely a part of my life. Um, it, you know, my dad's an amazing singer, one of the best singers I've ever met. Um, I've always really enjoyed art and like poetry and stuff like that. I've always written poems or. Uh, we had like an English class and that was my best subject in school. And we had, you would write a haiku or a sonnet or whatever, like all these, you know, like things that are more academic, but for me, it was really mm -hmm. fun. So I always loved that piece of it. Um, but sports was by far the front runner when I was in high school. And so, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, music was a back burner. Didn't really ever consider at all doing that professionally. Um, but I enjoyed it. Kind of sounds like you would have been a hit with the ladies. You're athletic. <laughs> And you could like, you're in touch with your sensitive side. You could write a poem to them. That was the main reason why I started playing guitar, actually, is just so I could get go. some. The problem is, you do, you, if you're the kid that brings your guitar to school and plays in the hallways, that's like the last thing you get. <laughs> Fair. You might get a couple bucks. I mean, you at least buy yeah, somebody totally. some lunch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, that's man. amazing <laughs> so if what you go and and you're doing the sports thing you have you know the the faith thing is a back burner was faith though always a part of your life mm. yeah it was and so like and like i said i had i was still doing music in high school um and actually what i uh, attribute as my salvation moment was um i was leading worship for i went to a small little christian school um and part of our our curriculum was we had a bible class and the Bible teacher asked if someone could lead worship. And truthfully, it was it was more because more by default, I was the only person that could play guitar and sing. So uh, I kind of just said, yeah, I'll sure I'll do it. Um, and I remember one moment specifically in my sophomore year, I was singing a song. I can't remember what song it was, um, but I remember reading the lyrics and I had like a light bulb moment of, OK, hold on for a second. If I'm actually loved the way that this song is telling me I am by the creator of the universe, like everything is going to flip on its head for me in this moment. And I, it was like for the first time I, I realized I had 
been aware of the truths of scripture, aware of the realities of God's love, but I didn't actually let them like infiltrate my soul. Um, and it was like this really beautiful moment. Well, I didn't cry or anything, but it was like, I knew in that moment, okay, God really loves me. And it was, it was like, even though I had become a Christian at five years old, I, it was a moment I went, God, I, I want my life to be uh, yours. And so I'm um, sealed for you. And so it was really a beautiful little moment as a 14 year old realizing that, that God truly does love me. Like he says he does. It's wild because there are so many people who would say they're Christians, but maybe not living that life. And I love yeah. how you said the light bulb moment, because that's when it truly is real. How did yeah. that shift the decisions that you made then from that moment forward? Yeah, well, I think so. Uh, ironically, um, that that year, my sophomore year of high school, um, our team, our baseball team couldn't get enough guys to field an actual team to play. So I was in this kind of like identity crisis moment to begin mm -hmm. with. Um, and I feel like that God used that. Um, it's like anytime you like create idols in your life, it, God has a way of, of tearing them down and bringing them back to you. You're bringing them back to him. Yeah. Um, and so it, I felt like there was a moment there where it earned a season there where God went, I'm going to take this away so that you put your attention on what, where it belongs. And um, yeah, it shifted everything for me. Cause even going, it was like that, that catalyst of me going to the Bible school started in right there. Like God started working on that story right there. So yeah. What did, oh, Johnny, sorry. Somebody doesn't just become the worship leader of, of Thrive Worship overnight. Do, <laughs> do you have this dream then? I want to be a solo artist. I'm going to be the next insert, whoever your favorite Christian artist was back in the day. Or was it, yo, this is what I want to do is I want to become a uh, worship leader for our church. Yeah. So uh, all the above, truthfully, um, I think it was there was seasons where I I really desired to do a solo project. I used to write a bunch of pop songs and love songs and um, I still, to this day, enjoy writing country music. Um, so I think there was all of these things that were uh, fighting for my attention and fighting for um, my passions. Um, but I remember while I was at that Bible school, I had got a, uh, there was somebody had a, a download of the Hillsong Live somewhere. Mm -hmm. I can't even remember what it was. I remember watching it and thinking, oh my goodness, this is something different. Um, and it's almost like that dream, like had now a picture with it. Like mm -hmm. there was like a, a dream inside of me that now had a picture. Um, and so when I got back to California, um, I, I ended up taking the summer and working at a, a summer camp, but then ended up coming back to our church and starting to volunteer. And at the time, mm -hmm. there was a guy named Lincoln Brewster who was leading worship. And I remember very specifically, I just started volunteering, leading worship for our high school ministry. Um, and I ran up to him after a worship night. Uh, and I literally, like, as he's walking off stage, grabbed his ankle. I was like, hey, man. <laughs> Like I'm Corbin, I've been leading in our, uh, in our high school ministry. And I, I will never forget. He kind of looks at me like, who are you? Like, uh. <laughs> uh, but it was really cool. You know, he's like, Hey, why don't you join the team backstage next weekend? We'll have some conversations about it. One thing led to another. Um, and I did, I started serving on, um, the worship team fairly consistently, um, ended up made sense for me to do this full time with the church, uh, 2011. Um, so 13 years ago ish. Um, and so, yeah, so I came on staff, I ended up going on tour for a while with Lincoln playing guitar, uh, writing a lot for him, producing a few things for him. Um, and then it kind of got to this point where we, you know, we had been writing, I have a, a good friend of mine that's a part of Thrive Worship as well named Taylor Gall. And he and I've been writing since high school. Um, and we kind of started talking about what would it look like for, our songs um, that we're writing to be a little bit more geared towards ministering to our church. Not, we weren't even thinking at the time about like making an album or, you know, going after trying to be an artist or anything like that. What if we just literally wrote songs for our church? You know, if we needed a, a fast song, like what if we wrote the fast song? If we needed something that talks about God's grace, what if we wrote that song? So organically we started writing these songs and um, one thing led to another and we ended up signing with integrity five years ago. Uh, and now we're on the other side of it, just realizing the heartbeat hasn't changed. We're hmm. still writing our songs for our church. And that's like the, the mission and goal. But songs like Poor Spirit, I all of a sudden have this set of wings that grows and, and ministers to the wider church or coming back or whatever it is. Um, and so that's been like almost kind of like uh, 
it's humbling, but also kind of like, man, what, what is God doing? Like, I never would have thought that would have happened. I dreamed about it. I thought it'd be really cool, but I didn't actually think it would happen. So that's a long answer for you, but that's kind of where the, the, or that's the progression of how I got to where I am today. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. And I love this about corporate worship, how here's these incredibly talented people like yourself writing music specifically for your church and for your community. And there's just something that resonates with way more people and mm. your story and your words of encouragement are now starting to be sung in congregations across Canada, across the US, maybe even across the world. For you as a singer, a songwriter, but a worshiper, what's that like knowing that that song you wrote for your people is actually for so many more people? Yeah, I mean, I, like I said a second ago, it's really humbling. I think that's the, the thing that that first hits me with it is mm -hmm. I think about, let's take Poor Spirit out for an example. Um, so that song, if you listen to the live version, I have a testimony in it and there's, uh, I can unpack that at some point as well. But but the conceptual piece of it is um, there's a lot of vulnerability that happened in the songwriting session. And it was a song that really wasn't supposed to, it was kind of like outside of the normal writing regiment we were doing um we were on a retreat in nashville and at the airbnb with just our team we started conversations and one thing led to another on the verses and the chorus and the testimony and all of that so i think what's really interesting is it was birthed from this place of true organic conversation but also from a place of vulnerability um which i think has been really unique to everything we've done is there's a there's a, a web or a, a thread of um, story that is a part of every song that we end up writing. Um, and I think that what's really cool about that is there's this concept that I just read about recently that our, at our very DNA level, like the DNA level of, of the way we receive information is actually best received through story. And it's the same reason why I think Jesus taught in parables. Obviously he knew mm. um, yeah. what, how we were designed. Um, but it's really interesting. I think for me, to answer your question from a different angle, it's it's like God's writing a story in my life. God's writing a story in Taylor's life, Melinda's life, Charmaine's life, whoever is a part of Thrive Worship. And he's kind of been, as a challenge to us, asking us to be vulnerable with those stories in what we're doing with specifically Thrive Worship's ministry. And now we're seeing life change on the other side of those songs that we're writing in someone else's story. And so, man, it's just so cool how God has this large plan that is like he's got a big chessboard or a matrix up there and he's moving things around and we have yeah. no idea what he's doing um but if we're obedient in the moments that he's calling us to be obedient it's like the fruit you can see from it is absolutely incredible so yeah that's my answer to your question from the angle of of looking at poor spirit out and just saying like there's mm -hmm. uh such a small scope we were looking through at the time and now we're seeing this massive impact happen from it yeah. And and we are going to unpack that a, a little bit later on. And I, I have some other questions. I do want to take a hard left for one second, though, because you right. talk about your your worship team. You talk about um, how close you guys are, uh, yeah. you being a worship leader and somewhat in charge as to what is going on in your church and what's happening in worship. What happens if you have somebody like Holly, for instance, who doesn't sing very well, but really <laughs> feels as though she wants to be a part of the Thrive worship team? Like, do you have like worship team one who maybe does all the recordings, worship team two who does Sunday nights, and then worship team three, say Holly, who does like Saturday mornings or Friday nights? Yeah. Wednesday we've, night prayer meetings. Right. <laughs> right. We've never dealt with any of that ever, of course. Um, no, honestly... For us, uh, we've had a few instances of, of that. And I think um, there's, I love this. We have a worship leader down at our Orange County campus. It's on the Southern side of the state. And um, he, we were in a, uh, a conference setting and somebody asked this question and he had the most amazing answer. And I thought it was really true to the heartbeat of how we've tried to um, operate in any, any situation like that. All he said was, look, um, when you have the responsibility of what's happening in God's house and the platform at God's house, there's a couple things that come with that. Number one, uh, you have to build something that is effective for God's kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, and part of doing that is recognizing that everyone is innately wired with specific gifts. So uh, the second piece of it is part of your responsibility is to also help shepherd people into where they're called to be. 
Um, and so we've had a couple instances where maybe someone um, wants to be a part of, of the worship thing, but really their best skill set is used on more team mentorship or it's mm. on, uh, you know, you name it, whatever the, the category is. We've had a few instances where it's actually, in our opinion, dishonoring to them to let them go down something that they're not skilled at and keep them keep themselves from doing something that God has innately wired them to do. Uh, and so I, I loved it. Alan, just like at, in that conference, it was like literally like if someone is on your team that is not good at worship, do not no. let them get on the stage. I love that. I love it. I love and the honesty. Not, and, it's, and it's from a place, it's it's actually from a place of honor and love. It's not mm-hmm. from a place of like, oh, it just, it has to be an A no matter what. It's like, no, really, it, it's not about that. I, I do think that it's good to to strive for excellence in what we do. But really, it's, it's about what is going to make the most impact for the kingdom. Um, and I think sometimes people, and including myself, we, we want to run in lanes that are not our lane. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a reason why they paint those lines on the, the lanes. It's like if you're going 80 miles an hour down a lane and oh you drift into the other person's lane, that's an accident. That's like yeah. that's danger. <laughs> like that's wow. not good. Um, so I think there's a reason why, uh, you know, God has painted those proverbial lanes in our lives um, because he's wired us for specific gifts and has specific plans for us. And so a long answer again to your question. But I love I, it. I really no, that's it, good. It, it's good. It's based in honor and love to to be able to just create something that has the most amount of impact for for God's kingdom. Yeah, Always putting I, the tambourine down. You know, I'm like, <laughs> and my singing may have caused accidents before, so you know what? That's a great analogy. <laughs> um, but Corbin, how old are you, roughly? I'm thirty. I'm thirty two. Okay, so I mean, you are a bit younger than than myself and Holly, but like back in the two thousands, early two thousands, it seems as though everybody had a worship album, yeah. and it and it seemed as though every like Newsboys came out with a worship thing, or or Skillet came out with a worship album. But now, as we have fast forwarded to like the late twenty seventeens mm-hmm. onto the early twenty twenties. Uh, yeah. It seems as though that there's a lot more churches who are getting involved. Do you see a change? Do you see a switch in how worship is? Or has worship still always been worship from 20 years ago to where we are now? Yeah, I mean, it's a man, what a question. Um, I do think that we have seen just I, I have this this concept of spiritual trends, right? Just like there'd be a trend on social media. I believe sometimes God is depositing things in specific people across his church, Um and so I do believe that uh, each time we see something new and fresh come up, it's because God's trying to, to, to work. And so, um, I, yes, practically, I've seen a huge shift in what worship, uh, like uh, the skin of worship, like a worship song, how it's created and how it sounds and all that. Of course, that goes like even with all the way down to the music trend level. Yeah. Um, but I, what I will say, there is a thread of a vertical um the, like the direction of vertical praise, I have seen that be the most timeless piece of worship music. Um, mm-hmm. I And I think there's ways that that has manifested in um, maybe the bridge of a song, or maybe it's in the verses of the song, but but I think the, the thread that has tied what I would call worship music together for the last 20, 30 years, maybe even thousands of years, if you look back to even Mozart and uh, mm-hmm. Bach writing, you know, symphonies for for what was church music at the time, there's yeah. this thread of a vertical praise. Um, and really it, it's a, it's a level, a leveling, right. It's a leveling of the playing ground, recognizing that at the foot of the cross, we're all uh, God's children. And so, um, yeah, I think when you look at today's worship, um, it has started to take a little bit more of the industry, if you will, by force, because I think oh. that um, people are hungry for it. They, they're they're They just came through a, season in the last three years where uh it would be really easy to lose sight of god and so those who are mm-hmm. searching after are are extremely hungry and they're going after what they would consider the real deal and so i think part of that uh, is as humans is recognizing that there's a there's a divine being that um is above all and is in control of all and when we get to that place of of hunger so much to the point where we're uh want nothing else but him the only option is to go vertical with our our worship. And so I think that's what I would say is the trend through the last 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. I love how just this conversation, yeah, it's about music, but it's also about the body of Christ. And yeah. just, I love, you know, the idea of if somebody can't sing, you know, maybe there's another gifting for them and just <laughs> encouraging the body of Christ to be the fullness of, of what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And it's just a, a wonderful way of also looking at worship because worship isn't just about singing. It's how you serve too. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about maybe the people who've helped you or, or served you as you've gone through this music yeah. career. And um, I want to dive into your story a little bit more because I Great. know on the outside, it's like, oh, wow, for Corbin, everything's awesome. Like nothing has ever <laughs> gone wrong for him. So. Right. Um, but you worship very... leader. Why would anything go wrong? Yeah, right? <laughs> I'm in California. It's all perfect here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's sunny skies and, you know, campfires and kumbaya, but that's <laughs> that's not life. And so let's talk about um, some of the seasons that just felt a little bit more darker even before the pandemic for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, um, you look at my, my story's had a, had a ton of ups and downs. So I come from a broken home. Uh, my parents split when I was super young. Um, I, you know, there were seasons where my dad was in and out of my life. Um, and it and it truly, it, it kind of forced uh, a number of things to happen. One of which was, uh, as I grew older, and especially grew older in my faith, uh, a reliance on, on someone was necessary, right? Um, so you, maybe I didn't have the most traditional home coming up as a as a young man or as a, um, even into my twenties, like learning how to lead. Um, but, but really there was a, a beautiful thing in, in finding the reliance on a heavenly father. And as tried as that sounds, um, mm. I think those who have walked through what I've walked through and, and let me be clear, my dad and I are great. We have conversations almost every day now, but mm. there's something about when you don't grow up with that, that person in the house, not that any human father will ever be perfect, but there is something that happens when they're not there. And so I think for me, uh, going on the journey that I went on to find the reliance on a heavenly father, and then not only find the reliance on him, but finding that uh, he truly does love. He does not leave. He does. Uh, he, his plans are perfect. And he, he walks you through seasons for, for uh, and trials for purposes. Um, and so I think, you know, there's so much uh, contentment and joy that's found when you start to realize, well, you know what, this may not have been the most like perfect thing for my life. But the reality is God works everything for the good of those who love him according to his will. And so I, I'm, I'm standing on the other side of so many uh, valleys, but recognizing mm -hmm. that the mountains that I've also been on um, are only evidence of God's faithfulness in my life. So as somebody who leads at a church, I mean, pastoral or, or yeah. worship. So if somebody is dealing with depression or yep. anxiety, if you have, maybe you don't have a personal connection or you just feel like garbage that day, how difficult is it for you to get up on stage and praise, even though, hey, listen, I'm feeling that at like a one or a two right now and I just don't want to be here. Yeah. You know, what's really interesting about that. And, I, and this is something I, I, I still wrestle with today is I, I read the Psalms and I see David's uh, just absolute mess of a life that he that he's mm. like put himself in, um, and the the honesty that he starts to converse with with his his creator about, and um, it's this juxtaposition of going, I'm in the the darkest point right now. I'm in the lowest point. I've uh, God's turned His back on me. And even there's moments where you see David just crying out in frustration or take away my enemies or whatever it is that he's going after. And almost every Psalm, not every Psalm, but almost every Psalm comes back to yet I will praise you. And I just think that's so interesting. And that's like the reality. If we were just honest with ourselves, like no one is coming into church every single time and just like on the mountaintop. Yeah. Um, no oh. worship leader is getting on stage on the mountaintop every single day. No pastor um, but I do think there is a beauty in those seasons of still being having the wherewithal, and it's tough to do sometimes, but having the wherewithal to say, even in this moment, my my decision is to praise. And that's really what it is. It comes down to a decision. Um, and sometimes it's hard to make that decision to be, I will. Mm -hmm. um, but the moments that I feel like I've, I've done that um, in our ministry, I've been some of the most rewarding, um, not just for me, um, but I think that it kind of creates a, a vacuum that the Holy Spirit fills. And, and really, it's actually kind of beautiful because it gets you out of the way and let, lets God work. And, mm -hmm. and as a result of that, not only do you get filled up, um, but the people that you're there shepherding, the people that you're there pastoring, um, it's like God kind of pushes you out of the way and allows the Spirit to work in their lives even stronger, which is a really, really beautiful thing. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, when it comes to re your relationship with your dad, you say it's, it's a good relationship yeah. right now, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, I, I like your origin story, though, you know, coming from the broken home. I also came from a broken home. And the way I perceived God when I was younger was very much the way my I perceived my father. Wow. And it yeah. was really interesting to see once you get a close relationship with God, how that can really shift not even your perception of him, but now your position and perception of your earthly father for you not having him around did that in some way taint your idea of who god was as god the father when your father wasn't there yeah i mean i think it's only natural to to go there anybody who's been through that and, and it's mm -hmm. not even always that scenario that takes you there but i think yeah. anytime that abandonment enters your life or betrayal or rejection um it's so easy for our human condition to point that towards the way that God's nature is. Mm -hmm. um, but we're broken. That's that's the reality. Uh, man, I had this awesome conversation. Uh, I think he shares this a lot on stage um, with a guy named Austin French and his particular story with his family. And, and just uh, the phrase he uses is like, uh, God loves broken people. And, mm -hmm. and reality is um, it takes journeys to get to that state. But, but like you said, as you kind of start to unveil the mystery of, of how God's true nature is like the more and more you see he's, he's not going to leave or abandon you. Um, but to your original question, absolutely. There are seasons I walked through where it's almost like a projection is put on God to say like, well, these people have abandoned me. So mm -hmm. God is naturally going to abandon me. Um, and, you know, I think that provokes a lot of un unhealthy uh, emotions and, and brain patterns that start. And for me, that part of what my story became was uh, I walked through a long, long season um, of anxiety and panic attacks from it. And so, yeah, as as I grew and as I learned, and, and thankfully my mom is an absolute saint raising me and my two brothers by herself. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, then honestly now just with additions in my life, like my wife, um, I've had all of these amazing people that, uh, that I know for a fact God orchestrated at the right times um, to step in um, and remind me of, of what's true about his nature uh, and that he doesn't leave and he doesn't fail. He doesn't abandon. He is always for us. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that has definitely been a journey that I went on and have continued to go on. And I'm sure I will until the day I die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a life thing. <laughs> yes. Oh, man, you know, I love your honesty and thank you so much for sharing that as it can be tough to navigate um, just, you know, our, our childhood scars and what does that look like when it comes to a relationship yeah. with with God and then anxiety, depression. So many people struggle with that. And also now coming out of a pandemic, I feel like even more people have yeah. had three years. Oh, I feel lonely. I, I don't know if it's worth living. What do you say to somebody who is battling depression and anxiety? Because it really is a battle. Yeah, man. Number one, uh, you're not alone. I think that's like such a an easy thing to say, but also like it's such a true statement. You're not alone. Um, even if no human is around you, God, God is there. That's like one thing I think I have uh, seen so clearly in my journey with this is um, at your darkest places, in the moments where you're at the you know height of anxiety, height of depression, um, there's this innate thing that happens when uh, you're at your, your like on your the, the bottom basically. If you if you hit rock bottom, um, that's like where God works the best. And so I think just a reminder to anybody who's walking through a season of that and maybe even doesn't have a light at the end of the tunnel because I've been there. Um, that you are not alone because at the very, very, very least, God is there and he's watching you. He has plans for you. He just wants to get a hold of your heart. Yeah, it's beautiful. As a, as a radio person, I think, you know, growing up, I always wanted to be like the Christian version of Ryan Seacrest. And <laughs> I, I wonder it. as <laughs> as a uh, as a worship leader is, I mean, so we look at uh, pour your spirit out and just how how it's you, you had said you're 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 humbled by it. Um, does, does a worship leader want to have like, oh, I want to have the next worship song. That's the next 10,000 reasons or the next amazing grace, the realization that, wow, maybe pour your spirit. There's actually something there. This could actually be bigger than what we imagined it to be. Yeah. So sorry. You asked, sorry. 
Can you maybe ask that question one more time? I said a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if I'm hearing you correctly, um, I think, yeah, there was, there's definitely um, times in my life that I've gone, man, it'd be awesome to have one of those big worship songs or whatever. Um, th- and this is going to sound like I'm trying to be overly humble here, but, but I think the older I've gotten um, and the, honestly, the more time that I prioritize my family, my daughters, um, the less I think about that. And the more I think about if God wants to use a song that I write, and, and poor your spirit out was, was something that kind of eclipsed a little bit of this. Um, but if God wants to use a song I write to remind someone in a season like I've been in, um, that there is uh, actually another page to be turned on their story and that God hasn't put down the pen if there's still breath in their lungs, then man, that's that's what I want to be a part of. I think about like, okay, what's the biggest song that's come out recently? Waymaker, Right. Man, how many amazing truths in that simple lyric that uh, even when I don't see it, even when I don't feel it, mm-hmm. like how many how many people have sat in that space and gone, I feel numb to what God's doing right now. I have not seen God move maybe ever in my life. Maybe he hasn't moved in years. Um, but then you come back to the chorus and you, rec- you recognize the truth is scripture tells us he's a way maker. So you, you, when you come out of the bridge, um, a way maker, you get to the scriptural truth that God is a way maker. And I, I don't know, I think for me, um, when I think about the songs that I write, I think about even just the conversations I have with the people I write the songs with. Mm-hmm. Um, so many of my favorite songs these days are, are being birthed from conversations about what God's working on our hearts about what mm-hmm. God's doing in our families. Um, you know, the ways that we're, uh, a, c- a couple of us are, are, you know, newer dads or we have, we have a few kids. Um, and so many of our conversations are about how do we balance being, um, on the road a lot more than we ever thought we would be yeah. with having kids that, you know, are yeah. getting older and questioning like, dad, you're leaving again. Like, yeah. you, I thought, or like last week, um, I, I went to church, like literally just went to work and, uh, my wife texted me and said, our oldest daughter said, um, that she she uh, didn't realize dad was going on another trip and was bummed that he wasn't going to be back every day. I'm like, I'm going to be back in like two hours. Oh. Um, but you know, it's just, as your kids get older, um, the music takes a different perspective. And I think for me, it, it becomes a little bit more going, uh, man, if, if there is going to be a big song, I hope it's something that helps somebody in their 20s recognize that um, God wants to do something great in their 40s. God wants to do something great in their yeah. 50s. And that there's a lifelong change that God wants to do in them. And so, yeah, I, I, it's a, again, a long answer to what you're saying, but I, I, I do really feel like there's a shift that happened for me a couple of years ago with that. So uh, pour your spirit out. The EP was released just a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah. Not that it's about me, but what, one of my favorite things is I love to hear a song and then hear an acoustic version, hear a live version, hear an EDM version of it, hear a screamo yeah. version. <laughs> I love So I love the idea of you guys taking the song and then saying, oh, by the way, try this. Or what do you think of this? Why did you guys decide to do yeah, or were you doing it for me and you just want this is your opportunity to it's tell probably me? Probably that. It, yeah. was, it was literally just for you. I, yeah. It's actually the only person that's turned it so far as you. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, okay. So for us, this is actually, I love this question because for us, we have a really like rigorous conversation anytime we release something. Nobody needs another worship song. And I just, I, as bluntly as I can say that. Um, but I do believe that when God wants to use something, um, that, that whoever he's, calling upon in that moment, they need to respond in obedience. And so um, we have, for whatever reason, had a few moments where God has called upon our team to, to release stuff. Support your spirit is one of them. And the more and more we talked about that song and saw the impact of that song and, and all of the DMs we would get on uh, Instagram or like the mm. conversations that would happen in church uh, or, you know, whatever, the emails that we would receive from our congregation, uh, the more and more we realized that God was doing something even more than, than we thought. Um, mm-hmm. and, and really the whole purpose of the EP, um, was to continue the story. Uh, we felt like there was so much life mm-hmm. change happening. If we could provide opportunities for more of that to happen, we wanted to do that. So that's why we did an acoustic version. There's a lot of churches that don't necessarily do the like full rock and guitars and everything that we have on a weekend at Bayside. They might do a little bit more stripped back where it's acoustic driven and maybe like, you know, a couple little shakers or something like that. I wanted to 
give them something that they could hear in their context and, and would help their church be ministered by the song. Um, the other one that is really unique on there is there's a lo-fi version on, on the EP. And I'm like, man, and I put little snippets of my testimony within the lo-fi version. And I just thought if, if somehow that could get on a lo-fi playlist and somebody's doing their homework or, you know, working at a coffee shop and they're like, what is this guy talking about? And they click on drive worship, go listen to the whole story. It's like, man, can you imagine the the impact that God could have? And so um, that was really the heart behind why we did the EP is we wanted to broaden the the funnel and the scope of, of that story. Hmm. Yeah, it's incredible because people will hear music differently and different sounds will speak to their heart differently. Um, it's, I don't know, the thing about a good worship song, it's like, incredible communication between you and God, but also you and the people who wrote it. And I know you've gotten a lot of feedback from this particular song. What was one story that stands out from for you, a, a testimony of this is what this song did for me? Because I know you've had some pretty wild stories come across yeah. your, your inbox. Yeah. Uh, man, there's so many. Um, I wish I could go into all of them. I'll take the one in particular. So we did a Bible conference uh, and the Bible com- the conference was being streamed online and we played pour your spirit out. Um, I, I shared my story. I, we actually did a moment at the end where we pray for people, um, who maybe were going through something in their lives and they needed God to show up in it. Um, well, uh, we didn't hear about this till a couple weeks later, but someone emailed the church and said, Hey, uh, my husband and I were watching on the stream. They're a little bit older. Um, and something was going on health wise with her husband and he had lost sight in his right eye. Mm-hmm. Um, and so during, during the time that we were praying, she prayed and they both, you know, she said they held their, held each other's hands and just prayed for, for God to come move. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she said, we, at the end of the prayer said, amen. And he turned to her and she turned to him and he was just crying. Um, I get choked up talking about this, but um he starts, you know, saying, Hey, uh, or she, she asked him, you know, Hey, are, is everything okay? And knowing there's probably some health stuff going on, you know, you never know what's going on. She said, are you okay? And he said, yeah, I can see out of my right eye again. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, what? <laughs> like That stuff doesn't happen. No, that's like <laughs> the stuff you hear about on the televangelist thing. Like that's not real. Like no way. Yeah. But I mean, I could tell you, I could sit here and tell you story after story of that starting to happen as a result of, again, of, a moment of obedience and vulnerability uh, with God asking our team to be uh, honest and open with the story that we had. Wow. We've been, we've been honored to have this opportunity to hang with you today. Um, We do talk about though, in the hills and valleys of life, where we ask God that question, God, why me? Why are you using me in this way? Or God, why do I have to go through this Uh, through everything that you've been through in your life? Can you think of maybe one moment where you had that conversation with God? Yeah. Well, let me, let me unpack my anxiety story a little bit more. So, um, I, uh, from the age of seven until I was 26, I had at least monthly, um, panic attacks to the point where I would be, uh, like shaking, uh, felt like I couldn't breathe, um, at various times would check myself into, you know, the local like ER or like the the med seven or whatever. Um, and nothing going on other than, having a panic attack. Mm. Um, and there was a season right before I got married where I went through 40 days straight. Um, I had a panic attack for one, something like that for, uh, 40 days in a row. And my wife had, at the time, she was my fiance. Um, she had heard a commercial on a local radio station for, uh, a pastor in our area who had actually written a book on anxiety that I had read. Um, he was doing a service on a Sunday night, um, to, basically talk about anxiety um and you know unpack his book a little bit more and uh let me this is where i'll get to the why me um i felt like when my wife told me about it the instant reaction i had was i'm not going to that Mm -hmm. um and it came from a place of going god i have prayed so hard i have been through every avenue possible to try and deal with this like why on earth did you make me built this way? Um, and I remember wrestling with him that night going like, I, I, I've heard all this stuff before. I'm not going to go subject to myself, uh, to a bunch of people that are dealing with the same thing and like have to rehash all this stuff. Like I, 
I had truthfully, I, I'd found a, a way of kind of managing with it. Um, but I just had come to the conclusion that this was something I was going to deal with for the rest of my life. Well, thankfully, my wife, uh, again, fiance at the time, convinced me to go. Um, and we went and sat in the service. And it was. It was a bunch of stuff I'd heard before. I was a little frustrated and like a lot of practicalities in there. Um, and I, a couple of times I almost actually got up and left because I was like, this is this is silly. I'm not doing this. Um, well, we, we made it to the end of the service and the pastor got up and he goes, OK. And, and I have to stress this piece of it. I wasn't born or I wasn't raised in a very charismatic environment. Um, I, I didn't really see a lot of like miraculous things happen. Um, now, when I look back on my life, I see how many things actually were miraculous that God yeah. did. Um, but, you know, I didn't, that, I didn't see stuff like that. You know, it wasn't something that I, I really um, experienced before. And the pastor was very practical with the way that he went through the night and even the way that he set up his prayer. So all he said was, okay, we're going to pray now uh, for people to be healed from anxiety tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, some of you, and he said two things, some of you are going to be healed. Some of you won't. Uh, and the reality is, no matter what the result of this prayer is, uh, God is working this out for his sovereignty and for your testimony. And then he starts praying. And it was like immediately, immediately, I felt like there was a presence pushing on my chest. I, I was like to the point where I was like, I'm, I feel like I'm going to fall over and I'm not doing that. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm standing there uh, and I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit just absolutely all over me. Uh, he says, amen. I just sit down in my chair and I cried for the next 25, 30 minutes. Um, I went up to the pastor afterwards and told him what had happened. And he goes, Corbin, I, I, I think God might have done something in your life tonight. And that moment was six years ago now, and I've not had one single panic attack since. Wow. 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 Amazing. Yeah. Uh, so many people <laughs> battle with anxiety. And I mean, it may not have been, you know, Benny Hinn pushing you over, but <laughs> 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 that's just to, to feel God touching you is an incredible testimony. And I do hope it encourages people. Um, like what the pastor said, so plain and simple, God's still working in your yeah. life, whether you're feeling his hand on your chest or not. And that's right. incredible. Yeah, it truly was. And I find myself on the other side now. And I, and we talked about poor spirit out so, so much today. Um, but it's just been so amazing to be able to go, Hey, here's my story. Here's what God did. I would love to pray for you. And, and as a result of that, seeing all of the life change that's happened for people, it's like, that's the reward at this point. There's going to be so much more reward in heaven, I'm sure. Mm. Um, but man, just here on earth to be able to see even a few people that as a result of me being honest and vulnerable, God using and, and working in their lives for something great. It's just, it's really, really incredible. The EP is available now at thrive underscore worship on the Insta at Corbin Phillips on the Insta. Uh, Holly might not be the next uh, tambouriner, but uh, <laughs> Corbin's going to put we her on, on, on Team D. Uh, brother, this is great. I appreciate you taking some time and hanging out with us. Guys, seriously, this is the best. Thank you for, for having me today. No worries. And I will start practicing the cowbell. Maybe that will work instead. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Corbin, thank you so, so much for being a part of our podcast today. Really appreciate it. Well, if you enjoyed what you heard today, like, subscribe, and check out more of our YouTube videos. Don't forget to follow us on all the socials, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and faithstrongtoday.com.